Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Ashish Kern, a PhD candidate in mechanical engineering at St. Anthony Falls Lab at University of Minnesota, Twin Cities. So uh, a lot of the talks that we have heard today is about petrochemistry. I'm taking a little offshoot from uh, the main theme of this like conference. I'm talking more about the chemical engineering aspects, particularly bubbly flows. So today I'm going to discuss a robust image analysis approach for high void fraction gas liquid flows <coughs> to begin with. So as we all know, bubbly flows occur frequently in natural systems, lakes, reservoirs, and many other places. And bubbly flows are also employed and used in many industrial applications, particularly in petroleum, energy producing, and chemical industries. Uh, we use them in aeration, hydrogenation processes, wastewater treatment, flotation cells, bubble columns, spargers, and so on. <clears throat> so uh, to characterize these different processes, which include bubbly flows, uh, which are actually important in many chemical and biochemical processes, which I mentioned, you know, it's really important to know what's the interfacial area that's available for heat and mass transfer, pressure drop, and so on. So how do you measure bubble size distributions? Well, they can broadly, there can be two techniques, intrusive or non-intrusive. Intrusive techniques are essentially those techniques which actually intrude in the flow, for example, suction probes, conductivity probes, wire mesh sensors. On the other hand, you might have non-intrusive techniques like velocimetry techniques or digital image analysis, which is what I'm going to talk today about. So <clears throat> what are the advantages of di digital image analysis? First of all, we have a lot of flexibility. It's a lot more robust to the optical properties of the dispersed phase. Optics alignment is far easier, and you can get information on bubble size, velocities, and all. But it has certain limitations as well. For example, when you have bubble images, you have to computationally process them, and it, it all you know, depends on the quality of images you produce. And again, the technique has to be robust to be able to process all sorts of images from all sorts of backgrounds and all. For example, I'm giving you four typical examples of bubbly flows here. The backgrounds are different, the void fractions are different, and one single technique may not be able to you know, process all the images, so it has to be robust. Well, now coming to the <coughs> relevance of the research that I am doing. So here's a hydroelectric power plant, and in the you know, near hydroelectric power plants, what you typically have is you have a huge impoundment reservoir of water, and uh, particularly in summer seasons, or even, you know, you can see very clearly that this upper layer, epilimnion, which is, which is you know, in contact with the air, is, uh, allows for efficient gas transfer, so the oxygen tra concentration in this region, regime is far high compared to this hypolimnion, which is very deficient in oxygen, unfortunately. This is the water that's being released downstream. So what do you have here? The water which is being released here is low in oxygen content. Now that's going to adversely affect aquatic flora and fauna. So that's detrimental for aquatic life, including fishes. So EPA has come up with regulations that you know you can't have a water being released downstream, can't have a oxygen concentration that's below a particular level. So you have to maintain that oxygen concentration levels in the downstream water. And essentially, that's what we're working on. Uh, we're trying uh, uh, to you know come up with techniques which can actually aerate or ventilate the water that's being passed through these hydro turbines. So among many techniques which have been proposed, one of the very uh, efficient techniques that we are uh, trying to implement is aerated hydro turbine, where we are actually aerating the flowing water through the hydro turbine itself. Because the turbines move at very high speeds, there's a low pressure generated. And if you bleed a port outside, it's going to suck in atmospheric air, which is going to be entrained into the flow. So. We worked at high, Cephal High Speed Water Tunnel, and here is we have a prototype of, here we have a small uh, design of a turbine blade, which is ventilated. So you have all those air ducts going in here, through which we are actually going to ventilate air. And we have a high Cephal High Speed Water Tunnel at St. Anthony Falls Lab. And we mount this blade into the tunnel and uh, ventilate this hydrofoil and carry out various measurements, which I'll be showing here. So experimental methodology includes shadow image velocimetry, 
It's essentially very simple. Here's a turbine blade, we ventilated. The ventilated air breaks down into bubbles, and we have a high-speed camera which actually measures the size of these bubbles. We have pulsed LED light source for, you know, focused illumination. Mm, so what did I do? Oh, okay. So in the high-speed water tunnel, we mounted this turbine blade, which forms a bubbly wake, and the wake we capture this image, sample bubble image. And we did this at different locations to be able to characterize the bubble size distributions at various locations downstream. And we developed image analysis technique which could actually detect not only the in-focus, but also the bubbles which are slightly out of focus. You know, if you looked at, sorry, if you looked at here, we restrain the uh, ventilation to about the center of the turbine blade so that all the bubbles stay, stay within that small field of view so that we can actually capture them using our high-speed images. So our image analysis technique, the you know, most challenging part of these techniques is to resolve, bu resolve bubbles from clusters because you know, bubbles often form those clusters and it's very difficult to resolve those clusters as you can see over here, for example here. That's what is actually challenging. And as you can see in the processed image, you have blue and red, and there's a magenta as well. I don't know whether you're able to make it. But the red ones are the resolved clusters, essentially. So here's a little, about, little bit detail about image analysis technique, which I don't think I need to go in, into that much detail. But essentially, we convert a grayscale image into a binary image and then categorize you know, bubbles into tiny bubbles, intermediate bubbles, and large bubbles and then we process them separately. So we'll discuss the cluster processing, which is what the novelty of this whole technique was. So we take all, all the clusters, we choose one single cluster, and as you can see, the, the cluster with, you know, hole inside that, that's an in-focus cluster because there's a very sharp intensity gradient, but when there is no hole in between, which, which means that there is no intensity gradient, that's out of focus. So first of all, you divide separately into in-focus and out-of-focus, and then you, you, then you use a separate set of operations on both in-focus and out-of-focus to get all the information about bubbles. So we'll discuss a little bit more about what are the morphological operations I used. So uh, pretty much it goes like this. We skeletonize, and we, did, we do a whole bunch of techniques to finally get the information about all the individual bubbles, and then we finally measure the size and shape of the bubbles. So, we, we realize that all small bubbles are necessarily spherical, but large bubbles could be spherical or ellipsoidal. So we divided the bubbles, uh, we determined the bubble shape by a Haywood circularity factor, which is the, P is the parameter here, A is the area, so if that's one, it's a spherical bubble, if that's beyond the range, that's an ellipsoidal bubble, and we use ellipsoidal fitting to get the different dimensions of the bubbles. All right, so now that we have the technique, an important challenge was to validate the technique, you know. How do you know whether, whether your technique is working fine or not? <clears throat> we have two broad techniques, you know, to validate our image analysis approach. First was using simulations, another one was, another one was using experimental validation. So first of all, we did simulations of bubble images, which, is, which means that we actually simulated bubble images in our lab, I mean, on our computers, and used our image analysis technique to process those simulated bubble images. So I'll show you one single bubble measurement using our simulation and then a whole polydisposed bubble size distribution measurement. And then we'll talk about experimental validation. So here is an image from experiment. We took intensity profile. It appeared like this. We, we manufactured the same intensity profile using mathematical functions in our lab and got this uh, bubble image on the side that's C. And so we have a single bubble image. And then we apply our technique and we found out that for different bubble images of different sizes, the errors are actually well beyond, well below 6%, which actually gives some idea that yes, our techniques are actually working perfectly fine. We had another set of polydispersed bubble size distribution where we generated around 900 to sometimes 1,000 bubbles and varied the void fractions in the whole range of 0.1 to 0.7 and applied the uh, our image analysis technique to process these. As you can see, most of the bubbles are actually very accurately captured, including the clusters are perfectly resolved in the processed image. So how do you characterize the efficiency of your developed approach? One simple way would be if you took a 
probability density function PDF on the bubble size. As you can see, the input distribution and the measure distribution are in perfect, you know, more or less perfect match with each other, which tells us that, well, our technique is working perfectly fine. How about if we looked at the sodomine diameters of the bubble, you know, bubble uh, images which we, act, you know, bubble size inputted and the actual measured size, we see that, you know, the line falls strictly on the 45 degree line, which means that we are measuring more or less perfectly correctly. So, and this, that, so, so that was about the numerical simulation, validation through simulation. The so simulation showed that we are actually, our experiment, our developed approach is working perfectly fine. Now we went a step ahead and tried some experimental validation. So how did we do that? Our image analysis information essentially tells us about the size and shape of bubbles. So if you want to, the way to validate it experimentally is if you are injecting a particular amount of air inside water, you know what, what's the volume flow rate is. And if there is a way that you can look at the images and infer what's the volume flow rate is, you can experimentally validate it. So that's what we did. We had the 2D bubble size information from the image analysis technique. We have velocity field of bubbles, which is shown here. And we use the volume and the velocity of the bubbles to actually infer the volume flow rate that's being actually injected inside. Something like this. I don't think this is important to notice. This is just showing you the calculation the way we did it. But what's important noting here is the blue line is the amount of air that we are putting in, 0.5 liters per minute. And at different locations in the wake of hydrofoil, turbine blade, I mean, you can see that image analysis technique actually accurately predicts the amount of flow rate. So that's about the experimental validation. Now we use this technique to uh, study a whole bunch of phenomena that's actually happening in the wake. For example, how the angle of attack of turbine blade would affect the bubble size distribution, how the Reynolds number affect the distribution, and so on. So as you can see, different bubble size distribution PDFs being shown here. We also notice the effect of increased ventilation. So if you increase the amount of air that you're ventilating, there'll be a consistent rise in the sodomine diameters D32 over here. As you can see, with the increase in ventilation or the void fraction, the sodomine diameter increases consistently. And that happens typically because, you know, the more amount of air you put, the greater amount of coalescence happens in the underwater, in the wake and the greater coalescence results to you know, larger bubble sizes, leading to greater sodomine diameters. We also identified you know, distinct uh, bubble breakup and coalescence regimes in the wake of a turbine blade, but we observed that you know, initially the number of bubbles increases, but later on it decreases, which indicates, which suggests that you know, initially we are, bubbles are breaking up, but as they go far in the wake, they are actually coalescing and the numbers are decreasing. So, this is how we actually validated, validated it by capturing the bubble size distribution at different locations. So here it's suggestive of a breakup event, whether as if you go down, well downstream in the wake, you will see a coalescence event happening. We did some high speed imaging to actually look at the mechanisms of bubble breakup and coalescence and see if it actually matches the bubble size distribution that we are getting from image, image analysis approach. So, we realized that you know when the bubbles, large bubbles break up, there is no generation of those very tiny bubbles which was seen in the last slide. As you can see, there's a huge peak at 0.2 millimeters, which indicates that you know there is a huge concentration of those small size bubbles. But you know when we look at these breakup events through high speed cameras, we don't see those tiny bubbles forming. So we ask this question: Where do these small bubbles come from? Because small small bubbles are typically supposed to be generated by a breakup event but we don't see them here. So we went, we went back and we looked at many of the bubble images we had. I mean, we looked at around hundreds of videos very patiently. And we identified two prominent mechanisms that lead to formation of those really tiny bubbles, which are very, very important from the viewpoint of mass transfer because they increase the, they have a high surface area to volume ratio. One of the very prominent mechanisms of those bubble generation was bubble tearing. For example, when you have a large bubble and in its wake you have small bubble traveling, it will eventually collide with the large bubble because of the acceleration and then tear a portion of the large bubble resulting into the, all those tiny bubbles 
which we saw in that peak. And you know, more interesting than that is what we observed over here, that you know, whenever you have a coalescence event, there is a tiny bubble breakup which leads to formation of those large bubbles. Now that's very counterintuitive because coalescence is all about you know, bubble sizes increasing. But what we observed is, very carefully in high-speed cameras, is whenever you know, two bubbles come and coalesce, a small instability actually pinch, pinches off a portion of those large bubbles, resulting in the formation of a really tiny bubble, which is very, very interesting from the viewpoint of mass transfer. As you can see here, two bubbles come, coalesce, but there's a pinch off forming those really small bubbles. And we also observe some really large bubbles by, uh, generally, you know, the coalescence events are successive. So two bubbles come and coalesce, but we also observe that there is sometimes, you know, what happens, there is something called cluster coalescence. So what that means is, you know, a multiple bubbles come together, approach each other simultaneously and coalesce with each other to form a really large bubble, which is what we observe from high-speed imaging. So that was kind of counterintuitive. This mechanism was counterintuitive. So finally, to conclude, we developed a robust image analysis technique. The technique was validated in two different ways, by simulations and by experimental validation. And the image analysis technique showed the occurrence of distinct breakup and closure modes in the wake of a turbine blade. And uh, the occurrence of breakup and coalescence, we proposed different mechanisms. And we confirmed those mechanisms by high-speed imaging. So I think. And we finally acknowledge the support from Department of Energy, Office of Naval Research, and Alstom Energy and Transport Canada, Inc. So I think that's what my presentation was. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer.